Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this program on gardening for butterflies. Um, our speaker today is Louise Senior from the Rutgers, Gardner, Rutgers Master Gardeners of Mercer County. Mm -hmm. um, she is part of the class of 2008 and she also works in horticulture at both the Morvan Museum and as a garden educator at Riverside Elementary School purportedly the largest organic garden at a public school in New Jersey. Luis has participated in the Citizen Science Project, Monarch Watch, catching and targeting butterflies for over eight years. She particularly loves the natural world and is most excited when she can unite history, plants, and people, as well as enjoy nature with new and old friends. So thank you, Luis, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and it seems like the presentation is going to be fantastic and a chock full of great information. Um, but before we jump into that, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of Luis's presentation, but please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Um, Luis has graciously provided me with a handout that has some links and other resources, and I will be sharing that in the chat once we get underway. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be a survey available. So we ask that if you have time, please complete the survey. It's always great hearing any feedback that you can give us. And if you want some more information on gardening for butterflies, the Master Gardeners of Mercer Counties has a website there um, that you can see on the screen. I'll be sending a live link of that out in the chat momentarily. So please check that out if you're looking for more information. And one last thing before we jump into the presentation, I just want to do a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard. This is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. Um, if you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all the features will still be there. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see your audio settings. So if you're using an external listening device, like a headset or earbud, you can check to make sure that it's connected properly there. At any point during the presentation, if you run into any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that, that will alert me, and I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to solve any problems that you are having. And lastly, as I mentioned, if you do have any questions, there is a Q&A or the chat button. You can use either of them to send it to us, and we'll be happy to, to address them at the end of Luis's presentation. So that is everything that I have for you. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Luis Senior. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, as as Andrew's mentioned, I'm Louise Senior, and I'm here on behalf of Rutgers Master Gardeners of Mercer County, and we are a part of the Rutgers Cooperative Extension, which exists to get research and information out from our state research university to our citizens through each of our separate counties. All of our programming is in accordance with anti-discrimination policies, and we're here for everybody. Oops, uh-oh, there we go. Um, and also just in case any of you are interested in becoming Master Gardeners, you can find out more about this at the web link at the top right. Uh, the requirements to become a Master Gardener are to complete a training course and then complete hands-on practical training, answering questions in our helpline office, and also working on various educational activities. Check us out, the more the merrier. We've had a pause during COVID, but we're now back, back in business. It looks like your screen isn't sharing. Uh-oh, <laughs> oh dear, okay. Uh, okay, because it popped up, I'm sorry. Okay. Because it had at the okay, I'll do this one. Share. How's this? Great. Is that now sharing? Okay. So this was about how we don't discriminate against anyone. This is the page where you can see the link. Or if you're interested in becoming a Master Gardener and joining us. And uh, now I can get started. 
Uh, I just want to mention New Jersey is a wonderful home to butterflies and central New Jersey where we are is in general is as well. Normally, if I had an in-person group, I would ask you all to raise your hand if you already garden for butterflies, but I'm not sure we're going to do that here. Um, I would also ask how many of you have already heard about the monarch butterfly decline and also if you've heard about other declines, even our state butterfly, the eastern black swallowtail. Um, but instead of quizzing you all, uh, I'm just going to go on with the talk, but let you know that we're going to touch on all of those topics as we go through today. So why should we garden for butterflies? Well, they are awfully pretty, so we want to do it for aesthetic reasons, of course. But usually, if your garden is good for butterflies, it usually looks good to most humans, too. Um, butterfly visitation is a sign of uh, healthy environment and ecosystem, they're an indicators uh, group of animals. Our ecosystems are made up of many, many invertebrates. That's, um, you know, um, mainly insects, but other animals without um, skeletons. Some say even three quarters of our biological systems are invertebrates. Butterflies are invertebrates that we can see. They're out flying around, they're colorful, they're out during the daytime. So when they're around, usually the other three, you know, the other batch of invertebrates are healthy as well. And so they're sort of like a canary in the coal mine. So it's important for us to, to garden for butterflies so that um, we're keeping the whole ecosystem safe. The other thing is, we think of butterflies as being so pretty, but we don't like to think about them as food, but they are. They're a very important source of food for many other parts of our ecosystem. Our beneficial wasps need protein to feed their young. So even though the adults live more on carbohydrates, they capture and take caterpillars and other uh, juvenile insects back to their young to feed them because the young needs protein. Birds are a huge consumer of caterpillars. In England and Ireland, I've read an amazing statistic uh, that the bird called the blue tit eats an estimated 50 billion moth and butterfly caterpillars each year. Here in the US, our chickadees, just to breed, need six to 9,000 caterpillars just during the 16 days that they feed their young in their nests. This is according to Doug Palamy, um, a professor down in Delaware. Um, they're not alone. Uh, many of our birds feed protein and fat-rich insects to their young, even if the adults stop by bird feeders for a snack of seeds. In North America, more than 100 species depend on caterpillars as part of their diet. And, lar and the larvae, that's the caterpillars, provide a majority of the diets for birds like the Tennessee warbler, red-eyed vireo, and rose-breasted grosbeak. Doug Tallamy has also said that caterpillars are kind of like leaves that walk. So it's food that's walking, and um, they've also been called hot dogs for birds. And along the way, butterflies also occasionally pollinate some of our flowers. Sometimes pollen gets stuck in their proboscis or caught on their wings as they drink nectar. But their role of pol as pollinators is often more incidental. So what do butterflies like? Butterflies love sun. I saw that there was already a question in our Q&A about what can, you know, I have mostly shade, how can I garden for butterflies in shade? Well, the butterflies probably aren't going to come if it's too shady because they really, they are cold-blooded. They're insects, so they're cold-blooded. And like all living things, uh, they also need food, only a little water, shelter, a place to mate and raise their young. Uh, but they do need that sun because they, you know, they cannot function below certain temperatures. Let's look at a little bit of their bi biology. They're in the order of Lepidoptera, uh, together with moths, and Lepidoptera means scaly. You can see in the upper picture the wings are covered in little tiny scales. As insects, they have six legs. The front two are specialized often to, quote, smell, which is scent. In some groups, 
those front two legs are greatly reduced. So when you look at a butterfly, it might look like it only has four legs, but they do have six. The butterflies have the three main parts, head, thorax, and abdomen, two antennae, and an exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is important because it doesn't grow as they develop. Unlike our children who grow from the inside and just get gradually bigger and bigger and bigger, butterflies and other insects need to shed and form a new exoskeleton as they grow. Um, the shedding happens during their life cycle. Uh, the egg hatches it's, and it comes out as a teensy caterpillar who eats and eats, and then it molts to a larger form. It eats and eats again, and a larger form. And these are called instars in insect speak. Finally, when they're ready, uh, their last instar then becomes a chrysalis or a pupa. The caterpillar in, has basically liquefied inside this new exoskeleton. And usually after 10 to 14 days, it will emerge as the adult butterfly. On our left here, uh, this is uh, these are some of our uh, Eastern Black Swallowtail butterfly caterpillars. The small one with a white dot in the middle is the smallest, the first instar, and then there's other stages. Over here, there's a close-up of a chrysalis with the butterfly that emerged out of it. You can see this chrysalis, the caterpillar came up and made its um, home on a stick and wove a small silk thread to hold it to that. So that's, that's that. Um, here's uh, some pictures of an Eastern Black Swallowtail or state butterfly who was fluttering around Morven Museum's demonstration garden um, back one spring. And because there were teeny tiny dill seedlings that we hadn't even noticed yet, but the butterflies could tell they were there. They're their host plant. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but here where this yellow circle is right inside there is the tiny egg that this um, mama black swallowtail had laid on her host plant. So it's truly amazing what they can find. So what do butterflies do? Well, they eat. The juveniles and adults eat different things. The caterpillars have mandibles, jaws, and they can chew on leaves. They usually get plenty of water from the leaves that they eat. Over here, you can see a, a swallowtail chomping down on some uh, milkweed, common milkweed. They often are specialized to just one kind of plant or plant family per species of butterfly. These are called host plants, and I like to think of them more like maternity wards for butterflies. It's where the young live. Uh, you've likely heard about monarchs and that they need milkweed. Our state butterfly needs plants in the carrot family, parsley, dill, fennel, carrots, things like that. The adult butterflies, on the other hand, only drink nectar. And uh, this is, so they need the flowers themselves to get the adults in. The adults have a specialized mouth, uh, Oregon. Uh, we common name for it is proboscis, and this is how they drink. You can see it coming down to this Q-tip. I took these uh, photos at the Philadelphia Flower Show in the Butterfly Li Butterflies Live exhibit. They give you a Q-tip dipped in sugar water when you enter, and then you can go around and butterflies land on it. Um, so you can see that the proboscis unrolls. Here it is. And then the butterfly drinks through it, almost like a straw, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. But for now, we'll just leave it there. Adults can fly around and find more food, but the babies need to be placed, that egg needs to be placed where their food is. And that's why the females lay their eggs only on host plants. So what else do butterflies do? They bask. Remember that I mentioned that they're cold-blooded. They can't fly if temperatures dip much below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. They'll find a place to bask in the sun to warm up their muscles so that they can fly. They'll crawl into the sun in the early morning. Their best temperatures are about 82 degrees to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So a little bit warm for us, but great for the butterflies. Butterflies in general will be active from about 60 degrees to 108 Fahrenheit. Hotter than that, they'll try to seek they'll slow down, it's a little too hot. 
So what else do butterflies do? They need to find shelter sometimes for overnight or in rainstorms, and sometimes even for hibernation uh, over the winter. Monarch butterflies do a migration south to Mexico, and they go into a hibernation state down there. One reason why they need to find shelter under leaves and rainstorms is that I've, I've read that it's that one raindrop hitting a butterfly is like a three foot wide raindrop hitting one of us. And so you can imagine that would really knock you off your uh, out of all senses. So what else do butterflies do? They patrol and they perch. They like high places to see. Up there, they can look for mates. They can watch out for predators to some degree, and they can sense food and host plants. So in your gardens, it's good to plan to have varied heights of plants so that some of the butterflies can be up high, some can be down lower. Another thing that butterflies do is they puddle. And generally, this is a male behavior, but occasionally some females will do it as well. Um, they'll land often in natural places. Uh, they'll land around mud puddles and they suck up water with minerals in it. And this get, and then the males actually give this to the females um, as they mate. The sodium is hard for any vegetarian animal to get, but also other minerals are dissolved in the water that they're taking up and in the, the little uh, gift that they're giving to the female during mating. They transfer these minerals so they get to, when she lays the eggs, they, it's believed that they end up being healthier because of uh, this mineral, almost like a, like a vitamin. And I hate to anthropomorphize this, but it's almost like the males are taking the females out on a dinner date by giving her this extra food to make their mating more successful. So what else do butterflies do? They mate and they lay eggs. These are our Eastern Black Swallowtail butterflies. This happened um, a few years ago during a demonstration of butterflies at a Master Gardener Children's Camp program. We were, it's our state butterfly. We were just uh, a couple of blocks from the state capitol and we planned to release these Eastern Black Swallowtails during the program in Trenton. Uh, but then when they were mating, we didn't want to disturb them. I even felt kind of bad photographing them, but this is, this is how they mate, in case you ever wondered. So how to garden for butterflies. I've said this already, they love sun. Your butterfly garden needs to have at least six hours of sun per day. It's better if it's sunny 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can get around this by planting flowers and host plants in various parts of your yard. One side of your house might be sunny in the morning and the other in the evening, for instance, depending on the shade of trees, things like that. You can also work, work around this by using containers. Uh, so you can use a smaller container that can be planted in a, you know, put out in a sunny area, and that will also attract butterflies. They don't have to be planted in the ground uh, themselves. Um, also in gardening for butterflies, you need to have varied plants, uh, but you also need to have lots of plants. It's better to have an abundance of one type of plant than just one of everything. Um, as butterflies are flying over, they seem to be attracted to masses of, of food for them to land. Uh, the adults will find your garden to eat, and if the host plants are also there, then they'll hang around and lay eggs so that you'll be supporting them. Uh, it's best to try to organize your garden for three long seasons of bloom, especially into the fall if you're interested in monarch migrations. A lot of butterflies come through here in September and October, and it's, it's just really wonderful to watch them. You also need to consider flower shape. Um, it, the butterflies are particularly attracted to uh, plants in the uh, what's called the composite family. They look like daisies like this down here. They like the flat shape. The disc flowers in the middle actually each have separate nectaries so they can land in one place flat and they can drink from many, many spots as they go along. Another thing about how to garden for butterflies, as I mentioned about the puddling, 
uh, you could, if you want, uh, buy a, a manufactured puddle place uh, so that you can have your own puddle club in your yard, but you can also make your own um, with a dish, add sand, let it collect water, but don't let the water get too deep or put rocks in it so the butterflies have something to, to stand on. Um, you know, the butterflies, you know, it's really better for them for it to just be wet mud. Uh, this will allow them to, to suck up uh, mineral. Of course, you want to be careful about mosquito larvae. Um, and also, you know, these aren't really needed to attract butterflies to your home. It's just something else you can add in there. So I personally prefer to keep any chance of mosquitoes uh, away from my house as I can. Another way to garden for butterflies is to delay your fall cleanup until spring. Um, some of our butterflies overwinter in leaf litter, like the morning cloaks, and uh, where they roost and they survive all winter. Eastern black swallowtails, as I showed you earlier, uh, will put some of the chrysal chrysalides on a twig or a stem of a plant, and that's where they overwinter. If you clean and grind up all of this in the fall, then you're not going to have those butterflies in the spring. Uh, we also advise that you avoid pesticides. Um, very few are specific to one insect only. Um, most pesticides would also hurt butterflies as well as all the other invertebrates uh, in your system. And think about how the pesticides might travel up the food chain. Uh, think of those chickadees eating thousands of caterpillars. The toxins are really going to add up in the birds as they go up. But I have to admit, some butterflies, like this one down here in the corner, is not one of my favorites. Um, if you grow vegetables, uh, the cabbage white, or also the cabbage looper, another um, species, are considered pests in our vegetable gardens. Their hosts are anything in the cabbage family, and um, it's yeah, you, you'll get a lot of holes uh, in your produce from their caterpillars eating your produce. They can be controlled through an OMRI approved, that is um, Organic Materials Research Institute, Review Institute approved uh, material called BT. It stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, it is completely safe for humans to eat, but it harms anything in the Lepidoptera. So if you want to protect your cabbage, kale, broccoli, from the cabbage whites, you can use, you can apply BT, but please be careful and don't apply it anywhere where other butterflies would go because it's it's going to ruin the digestive system of any butterfly that eats a leaf that has it. But it is an effective way to protect your, uh, uh, your crops. About uh, delaying fall cleanup, here's one of the reasons. I, I don't know, you can, this witch hazel, uh, last March was blooming, and this comma butterfly right in the middle, it's almost camouflaged, uh, was attracted to it on a warm spring day. Uh, bees overwinter as adults, just like the morning cloaks and uh, the question marks, and they need that leaf litter thing. So that's a good reason not to clean everything up. Um, and so that's an important reason to leave some of your perennial grasses and perennial plants standing throughout the winter until the soil and air warms up. Uh, there are host plants for some of our local butterflies. I'm just going to go through this kind of quickly. Some of it will be listed on the handout that you can get after the program. Um, milkweeds for monarchs. Eastern black swallowtails love the carrot family. Some of you may consider them uh, parsley worms. Uh, they might eat your parsley, but they are our cape butterfly. Trees can also be host plants. They're hosts for the tiger swallowtails uh, that flutter among the treetops of the tulip poplar trees. Cone flowers are great for American lady, painted lady, and others. Hollyhocks also, and there's also many other uh, host plants as well. Another great plant uh, that has become popular in recent years 
is this one, um, hairy balls or balloon milkweed. Another name for it is bishop's balls. Sorry, it's not native to North America, but it grows very well here as an annual. It is a milkweed. And um, the last two summers, I've actually found more monarch eggs and caterpillars on it than on our common milkweed, um, including the first monarch caterpillar, my first monarch caterpillar of the year just this past Friday. Uh, a note about hops that I have down here. It's a great host plant for commas, question marks, and red admirals. And it makes a tasty tea as well as flavoring for beer. Uh, but it attracts a relatively new pest in our region, spotted lanternfly. Because the lanternfly is attracted to hops, many local gardeners are tearing hops out of their gardens. So just wanted to give you that warning when you see that hops is a uh, is a host plant. So this, uh, I just wanted to show you, if we were in person, I would hold up the book and show it to you. This is one of my favorite books um, for, it's a, an excellent beginner book to learn more about butterflies and their life cycles and their relationship to our garden plants. I highly recommend it. It only covers 23 species of butterflies, but there's wonderful pictures of of each of these and their stages from egg through each different caterpillar to help you identify them. So what their chrysalis uh, looks like and then the adults and there's more information in it as well about their host plants and nectar sources. Children love it too and adults can learn tons from it as well. So now I wanna get into our top nectar flowers to attract those adult butterflies into your garden. I also forgot to give you a caveat at the beginning of this program. I'm not, I, I cannot identify every butterfly out there. I know people who can, and I'm amazed, but that is not uh, yet my expertise. I'm working on it. Uh, but what I love to do is identify what comes to me, what comes to my garden, and then I can see it, watch it, observe it, and identify it. Um, and so that's, that's the basis of, of this. So here we go. And don't worry, I'm not going to name 26 plants, even though it's A to Z. Asters are wonderful for late season butterflies. You can see a monarch um, landed over here. And asters bloom right up until frost. And it's, you know, it's just a terrific plant for them. They also can be very tall. And so that'll give you some of the varied height that is wonderful for butterflies. Another great nectar flower is ageratum, or sometimes called flo floss flower. And um, this is another one with a relatively flat flower top that the butterfly can land on, and then nectar from many of those different, different flowers along the top. All of these plants, by the way, are listed in the handout uh, that, you can, um, that you will be sent, I believe, or can get in chat. Uh, another one of my truly favorite butterfly plants is Brazilian verbena or verbena bonariensis. Uh, some people call this the see-through plant because it has long, thin stems and you can plant it among other plants but see the other flowers through them. And these purple clusters of purple flowers sort of float on top in your garden. Uh, butterflies are attracted to this like a magnet and they land on it. And you can see from the flower structure, there's many tubular flowers. Uh, they can get their proboscis in there and, and drink nectar from each of them. Many of us might not think of chrysanthemums as a great butterfly plant, but these old fashioned chrysanthemums pictured here are a Sheffield, um, hillside Sheffield pink uh, chrysanthemums are fabulous. They bloom right up even past light frost and uh, butterflies are attracted to the disc of yellow uh, disc flowers in the middle and they're just fabulous to feed, especially to feed those monarchs on their long migration down to Mexico, the stragglers are coming through. Cone flowers, which are blooming in abundance all around us now, are also wonderful flowers. These are echinacea. And you can see again, the kind of uh, close up of the nectaries in the, the plant itself. 
But I want to warn you, uh, it's better with cone flowers, with echinacea, to stick to that true species, like we see back here. These pictured are also cone flowers. They're fancy new, um, uh, new varieties that have been bred because people like the looks of them. But you can see that the nectaries are going to be a lot harder for the butterflies to get to. So whenever you're choosing plants, it's best to try to get plants that are as close to the native form as possible, uh, because the flower structure just might not be as beneficial uh, to the butterflies as the native is. Another one that's great is goldenrod. Again, it's a fall bloomer, so it's going to produce uh, lots of food for the butterflies coming through in the, uh, in the fall. Don't confuse it with ragweed. Many people avoid goldenrod because they think of it's going to um, uh, produce hay fever and, and horrible allergy symptoms, but goldenrod does not. Uh, that's other plants that bloom at similar times, so it got a bad rap. Uh, but goldenrod's a wonderful plant for bees and for butterflies as well. Lavender is another one. If some forms of lavender bloom in the spring, some in the fall. It's not a native to here, but it's a wonderful plant to have. Even though it doesn't have a flat place for the butterflies to land in nectar, they tend to land and crawl up the side of the, the flower spikes of the lavender, and it's just wonderful. This is one that many people might not think about. Uh, but lilac is a particularly important early season nectar source. It's important because it blooms in an in-between time. It's between the early spring flowers and the summer blooms. And butterflies are really attracted to it. Again, you can see a profusion of the tubular flowers with wonderful nectar in them. And then, of course, we love it because of the, uh, because it smells so good. Mexican sunflowers or tithonia is a fabulous and also a magnet for, uh, for butterflies, especially monarch butterflies. These are annuals in our region. They're not native. They're native to Central America. They also grow very tall. So they're, um, they're a great perching place for monarchs and for other butterflies. And they just, they seem particularly attracted to them. Uh, in, in my gardening experience. Another one are pentas, or sometimes called the Egyptian sunflower. Um, these are annuals, but they bloom almost nonstop throughout the summer, uh, right up until frost, and they provide many, many nectaries. So again, that kind of one-stop feasting for the adult butterflies. Tall garden phlox, phlox paniculata, even though we have many varieties and different colors, this is actually a native North American plant. And it's a wonderful plant for butterflies. Uh, there's many, many different varieties and they just literally flock to it. There is one in particular though, um, Phlox paniculata giana, um, that in the Mount Cuba Phlox trials, Mount Cuba is a fabulous public garden down in Delaware that is dedicated to native plants. And if you haven't been, I strongly recommend a trip down there. Um, they also have a trial garden where they're doing experiments to observe which plants of many varieties of one plant, which ones grow best and which ones attract more pollinators, bees, butterflies, et cetera, than others. In the Mount Cuba trial, uh, Phlox giana attracted many more butterflies than the other varieties, and it's not quite understood yet why. Uh, I don't know if you can tell in this picture, but the blooms of giana are actually smaller than regular garden phlox. So it's a, a little bit of a mystery, but uh, maybe there's just many more of them there for the butterflies to eat. Another one, this is an early spring bloomer generally, although there's sometimes a, an encore bloom in the fall, is sweet william or dianthus. Um, it's a, you know, another flat flower, easy for landing and feasting. 
zinnias are an old fashioned flower, but they're also a, um, a, an excellent butterfly uh, source. They had kind of gone out of style for a while, but now a lot more people are growing zinnias, I think in part because of this emphasis on growing for, for pollinators in our, in our area. Um, there are many different types of zinnias and uh, the, oops, sorry, the University of Kentucky uh, a, a number of years ago now, at least five years ago now, um, did a study and they found that one variety, Lilliput, uh, attracted three times the butterflies that other varieties had attracted. They had 10 test plots and they grew um, 10 test plots uh, in slightly different areas. And they grew, they divided each one into quadrants, four parts, and they grew uh, Lilliput, State Fair zinnias, Oklahoma zinnias, and pinwheel zinnias. And of these, the Lilliput were the main attractors. They had students go out and monitor them. And there's a publication online if you want to take a look at it. There are also lots of other wonderful butterfly plants, um, but now we're to Z. So that's the end of my list. I've just uh, listed the ones that I have particular experience with, uh, but you can also grow sunflowers, petunias, morning glories, sedums, four o'clocks. There are many others, and there's many sources online and uh, in books to find out about those. But here's a word about butterfly bush, uh, Budlia. Uh, it, is, uh, it is controversial. It is a butterfly magnet, especially in the fall, but it's on many, many do not plant lists. Uh, the New Jersey uh, Depar Department of Environmental Protection, uh, New Jersey Invasive Plant Strike Force, several towns have it on their do not plant list. Um, but it's not, or at last I looked, it was not on Duke Farms do not plant list, which I thought was interesting. Um, it is, not native and it has been known to escape into the wild and that's why uh and it does not support any um any juveniles it is not a host plant at all but it does provide lots of nectar sources for the adult butterflies um the state of oregon banned it and it's uh perhaps much worse out there uh because it ran down wet riparian areas into uh, into forests. One way to get around this is you you can still have um, the abundance of blooms from a butterfly bush if you plant one of the newly developed feral varieties. Um, they are Budlia Lo and Behold, and there's another um, a, another group of the Flutterby group, Flutterby Grande. These are um, butterfly bushes that stay smaller and they don't produce fertile seeds, so they don't get, they don't escape. So again, why garden for butterflies? Well, I, you get it by now. You want to heighten your own awareness of the natural world around you. You can help life flourish and help fight the shrinking habitat of, that, uh, that we're causing by constructing and destroying nature. It also helps you connect with nature. Um, back during, uh, yeah, there you can bloom where you're planted. You can bring nature into your own home. Um, back during the World Wars, victory gardens were, were very popular in the US and England to produce food during the hard times. And today, uh, there's a new uh, emphasis on perhaps victory gardens for pollinators. So we can all add uh, plants to support butterflies and bees and other pollinators into our gardens so we can help that movement. I want you to think about making your home a haven for wildlife. This is a home that I, I see often, I drive by it. It's The garden is lovely, the trees, the shrubs, the lawn, everything is very uh, perfect. But the only thing here that I can see that supports any wildlife at all is the oak tree, which is a fabulous supporter of wildlife and moths and all kinds of insects. But 
there are no flowers here for butterflies to be attracted to. Another home I drive by a lot, and this is of a, one of our Mercer Master Gardeners, full disclosure, um, is this yard that's filled with abundant sources of flowers. I'm not saying you have to go this far, but if you do, that's wonderful. Uh, you can probably go kind of an in-between zone. This is another home I drive by a lot often. Um, they just have these pl uh, flowers planted right along the driveway. If you go, if you look directly onto the house, it would look a lot more like that first house I showed, mainly, you know, grass and and under control shrubs that don't bloom. But they have lots of things here for butterflies to feast on along the side. I also want to warn you or caution you, no matter how much you're, but you're gardening, please make sure to just sit down and spend some time in your gardens and appreciate them. Here I am with one of my sisters up at her house. Um, it's just, you know, a lot of us at garden spend all our time working and we don't just sit down and watch. And that's when you actually get to see a lot of the butterflies is when you're kind of quiet and watching. Another way to really uh, increase your appreciation of butterflies is to attend events to go see butterflies. Here's another shot of that uh, Philadelphia Flower Show Butterflies Live uh, program that I mentioned to you. And it's it's pretty amazing. It was inside the convention center, but the butterflies are just landing right on people. Even my head, uh, this little girl had lots of them around her. The one on this woman's nose stayed there for a really long time. It was kind of alarming. Um, but that's it. And I'd like to thank you very much uh, for attending today. Um, we are part of um, Rutgers Master Gardening Program, part of Rutgers Cooperative Extension. If you want to reach us, there are uh, four different ways. Uh, our program exists to help you. And there's lots of information online now on the internet and social media. Sometimes it's hard to decide which answer is best. Versa County Master Gardeners exist to help you sift through all those answers. You can come visit us at Extension. You can walk in in person. You can call us. You can email Ask the Master Gardeners. Um, photos are, are welcome. And then a fourth way, often um, at different events uh, around the county, uh, we have a tent up and we have Master Gardeners there ready to answer questions at local festivals. And we have two important events coming up uh, in our area, in our county, um, coming up soon. Uh, the first week in August, Saturday, August 5th, is the Watershed Institute Butterfly Festival. It does require pre-registration. So this link is where you would pre-register. And there's a fee. It's $10 a person or $25 per carload up to six people. And it's at... Uh, on 31 Titus Mill Road in Pennington. It's a beautiful festival. We'll also have our Master Gardener tent there set up with Master Gardeners happy to answer questions. The other event that's coming up is our uh, personal beloved insect festival. Uh, it's been going on for almost 20 years, I believe. And it will be Saturday, September 9th from 11 to two. It is free and open to all public free parking. Uh, you can see many stages of butterflies, but also a lot of other insects there. It's fabulous for children or adults. It's out on Federal City Road, uh, right next to the Equestrian Center is where we're located. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I'm, I'll leave that up for people, but I'm, I'm now finished, Andrew. So thank you all very much. And I urge you to put these events on your calendars to go out and see butterflies uh, alive in front of you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Louise. Um, we're gonna move on to the Q&A section now. So if anybody does have questions, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A or the chat um, and we'll be happy to, to address them. So we can jump right in. Um, is Brazilian verbena invasive in New Jersey? I believe it is in Maryland. Oh. I have not heard that. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, I, I do know that once you grow it in your garden, you often will have it, uh, you know, 
you, you'll often have it come back the following year. I look at it as a weak perennial. Uh, it doesn't always come back, uh, but it does recede and it will it will spread. So I can imagine that it could it could make its way onto a an invasive list. I have not seen that. I'm going to have to check that out. I'm very sorry of, about not knowing that. Uh, thank you for letting me know about Marilyn. Um, are there any bushes that get flowers that you can plant for butterflies? Well, um, let's see. A butterfly bush, you know, the budlia that I talked about is is a shrub, and that is one that uh, that will grow. Uh, a lot of lilac, as I mentioned, is uh, is a shrub. Uh, can be quite tall, also. Uh, there are I there are not many shrubs that I know of that bloom throughout the season. I think spirea would be fine. It blooms in the spring. Sometimes you can shear it back and get a second bloom from it. Um, there's white spirea. There's you know there's the pink. Um, I'm trying to think of shrubs that um, I am not sure. I don't think I've ever seen butterflies, particularly on things like azaleas and rhododendrons, but I'm not positive about that. Um, but there are, you know, there are shrubs that bloom pretty much anything with that kind of tubular flower that provides nectar uh, would, you know, would um, would support butterflies. Beauty bush would be a nice one, but yeah, they really only bloom for about a week. And so that's one of the reasons why the annual flowers that bloom and bloom and bloom for a longer period are a little bit more effective in getting butterflies to your garden. But that's another thing that I should look up and, and uh, pay more, more heed to. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody said maybe button bush. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that could be. Um, bushes and shrubs. Okay. Okay. Are there um, others, or I see? Are butterfly feeders available to use, similar to hummingbird feeders, where sugar mm. water is made available as nectar for butterflies? If yes, what are the pros and cons of such a device? Hmm. Um, I don't know if you can buy them. I'm pretty sure that you can buy almost anything, though. I have seen people make them out of. Uh, the plastic, um, uh, it's like a, a plastic champagne glass, a disposable one that's a, a low cup, and they've put uh, like a plastic scrubby, you know, a, I don't know what else to call it, something that you clean your dishes with in it, and then they fill the, the champagne glass, low champagne glass with a nectar like you would for a hummingbird. And the plastic scrubby is a place for the butterfly to land, and then they can put their proboscis down into it. And that does act as a feeder. Um, I've had better luck with them just coming to flowers, personally. But you can, um, some people say, to then make like a paper or, or something weatherproof, uh, colored sort of petals around that center of the um, of the disposable champagne glass, if that makes sense. So that's that's something that you could make. I'm sorry I don't have any pictures of that kind of thing, but um, yeah, there's not as many, it, it doesn't seem to be as popular as say hummingbird feeders are. Also many of the flowers that attract butterflies also attract hummingbirds to your garden. So another thing. Uh, given that it's better to plant more of the same kind of plant, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for those who only have a small garden space? Oh, oh, I understand. And um, I also have a lot of shade at my house. It's one of the things that made losing some of the trees. Like I, I've lost some ash trees to emerald ash borer lately. So it's really awful to have to cut them down, but it's made more sun in my yard. So that's better. Uh, so, you know, with the, um, basically, if you can just get a, a patch of something that will bloom, you know, for a while, and then try to, try to organize it so you have 
something blooming throughout all three seasons. Uh, that's one of the keys. And often you can plant your gardens so that um, some of the things like, uh, like echinacea, the cone flowers, can be plant interplanted over some of the early spring uh, things like dianthus, things like that. You can, can grow them that way. I, I hope that makes sense and gets, gets to you. Um, but I would say to try to choose a, a couple of the plants uh, to be sort of featured during the season and to, and to practice deadheading, to cut them back so that they will, that's taking off the spent flowers so that it will encourage them to bloom again. So in a smaller space, you can do, you can probably arguably do more of that than if you had a huge garden because you don't have as many to work on. And then as long as you just keep things blooming and you can talk to your neighbors, it doesn't have to be just your yard. If you can set an example and maybe have, you know, your whole street or your community pay a little more attention to growing these things, then uh, you effectively have a bigger garden that way. Um, were all the flowers mentioned native to New Jersey, unless you spe spe specified otherwise? Hmm. Probably not. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think back to them. Uh, unfortunately, not. Um, these are these are sort of garden favorites. Uh, they're ones that I had experience with. Um, relatively few of them were uh, were specifically native. I should look at my list, and I'm not seeing it. So on the, I believe I yeah the. Chrysanthemums, I don't believe, are natives. Um, the verbena is certainly not a native. Um, yeah, asters are native in North America. Many asters are. The echinaceas, um, goldenrod, lavender is not, lilac is not, Mexican sunflowers are not, but they're very valuable. The pentas are also not. Uh, garden flocks are, so out of the few, you know, out of the small list, you know, I'm sorry, less than half of them were actually native uh, to New Jersey, but they are common. Um, they're, it's relatively hard to get native annual flowers, and annuals are often what help keep things blooming in our garden between, you know, over the season, because they'll they'll keep blooming and blooming and blooming, like the zinnias, okay? So. okay. Um, is spice bush good for butterflies? Yes, it's wonderful. It's a host plant. Okay, so there are shrubs like that that are wonderful. Like the tulip trees are host plants for the, uh, the yellow tiger swallowtails. Spice bush is a host plant for um, the spice bush swallowtail, which is just a it's another beautiful butterfly, and it has a particularly interesting caterpillar. Um, the caterpillar itself almost looks like it has eyes. Some children sometimes say, oh, it looks like a Pokemon or something like that. It has artificial eyes that help uh, distract or help scare, as I understand it, help scare off some predators from eating it and uh, distract it. And it's, it's a wonderful butterfly. It's similar to our Eastern Black Swallowtail, but um, with a slightly different uh, color patterning on it. All right, I don't see any more questions. Okay. So okay. do you have anything you want to close with, Louise? No, I just, uh, I just hope that everyone, um, you know, can go out and enjoy their gardens. And even if you don't garden yourself at home, there's wonderful places you can visit. Um, I welcome everybody to our Master Gardener Insect Festival on September 9th. Um, the Watershed Festival should be wonderful too. You can come visit our demonstration gardens, um, you know, uh, during the daytime uh, that are over at that same Federal City Road. And uh, you can bring questions to our helpline and, uh, and you know, email or call in or visit. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, and also, you know, a walk around the Princeton campus, 
for many of our college campuses now are planted more and more with plants for pollinators that are wonderful. And then there's also our public gardens here in New Jersey. So I hope that you can get out and enjoy. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank, Thank you so much, everybody, for attending today. Um, this program is being recorded, so look out for an email with a link to the recording once it's available on our YouTube channel. And Thank if you have time, again, please complete the survey. We always appreciate your feedback. Um, just want to close with saying everybody be safe, be well, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you.